Welcome to the Top Knot Squad, a podcast for the mom, parent, or woman who doesn't exactly fit in, but loves hard anyway. Hosted by Naya, Adriana, and Alexis, three friends passionate about their beliefs and unafraid to speak their minds. Are you ready to laugh, be vulnerable, and keep it real with us? Top Knots are not required. On today's episode, the squad will be discussing food. Hashtag three noms. Food is a part of our daily lives and very much necessary to our survival. With that being said, why is it so darn hard to get our littles to eat the right stuff? We'll be talking about what we all did, and I, Naya, will be chatting a little bit about breastfeeding and bottle feeding. But first, a word from our sponsors. After a troubled few months of nursing, I decided that the best choice for our family was to introduce Galen to solids at four months. I was worried about what foods to introduce and if I was making the right choice. That's where Rooted Baby comes in. I spoke to Brooke, the founder of Rooted Baby, and she walked me through her process. After researching how baby food could be shelf-stable for so long and what it does to the quality of the food, it became evident that a solution was needed. Not only does the processing remove nutrients, but there are few options on the shelf that are low in fruit sugar. By partnering with local farms for produce, Rooted Baby uses the freshest ingredients because they are harvested right before they are whipped into your little one's meal. So, how do you get Rooted Baby into your home? Brooke delivers, or you can find it at several Austin farmers markets. Um, And that was definitely something I know Galen really enjoyed, her little pouches. So, Pouches are life. Yeah, for real. Yeah. He inhales them. We always keep on in diaper bags just in yeah. case we're out somewhere and can't get food in a proper time or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they are lifesavers. All right. We ready to chat, ladies? Let's do it. All right. Let's start with um, beginning stages, which would be with your fresh new baby and breastfeeding and bottle feeding. Yeah. So I guess this is where I come in, yeah. huh? <laughs> Finally being put to use in the pot. Excellent. <laughs> So uh, I'm sure many of you who have breastfed or bottle fed your newborns know that newborns want to eat very, very frequently. Most newborns, whether breastfed or bottle fed, um, want to eat at least eight times per day. So that's typically every two hours or at least every two to three hours during the day. And that basically makes feeding a full-time job, regardless of whether you're putting baby to breast, pumping milk, or um, bottle feeding baby formula, it's it's definitely a full-time job and it can be really taxing for moms. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, it can be really taxing for the lactating parent. Let me be more inclusive. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm working on that, guys. I'm working on it. Um, so it can be very, very taxing and it's, it's hard to to be able to breastfeed your baby on demand or bottle feed your baby on demand because not only do you have this small child, sometimes there's older children in the picture, you may also be recovering from birth, whether it was vaginal or whether you had a cesarean birth. You're still recovering. Um, and then there's those hormonal changes, which I think all three of us can agree are a bitch. Um, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's no real sad. other way to put it. They, they're they intense. They're really, really intense. And you can go from super happy and smiley to crying at one of those Sarah McLaughlin SPCA commercials <laughs> where they're showing the, pe- the puppies and the kitties with the really big eyes in the cages. So yes, talking about the beginning, like I said, um, breastfeeding and bottle feeding can definitely present a challenge for all parents. There are There's a huge learning curve with breastfeeding, whether it is your first baby or your fourth mm-hmm. baby. Every experience is different. Every baby is different. You do run into those unicorn moms, though, that are like, oh, my baby, I just kind of put him near the breast and then he latched and it was magical and beautiful. And that's not (laughs) always the case. Is that what they sound like? (laughs) That is no, that is what they sound like, because um, with my oldest, his like our breastfeeding journey is what really got me into lactation and made me realize I wanted to do this as a career. But when I told my husband's aunt and his cousin about all the issues that we had with milk supply and all of that, they were like, oh, I didn't even know that those were issues. I just put baby to the breast and it went beautifully. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, so they, they do exist. There are those women who don't really have breastfeeding issues. Um at, but there are few and far between. Um, maybe it's just the, the course of like the line of work that I'm in, but I do see kind of really intense issues. Um, and there is so much information and so mm-hmm. much access out there for lactation resources. Maybe in the notes for this, I can send you a link with um, information yeah, on, on lactation resources, at least in the Austin area. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so giggly. I did have some rosé and boob cake before we came here. <laughs> so uh, my birthday is actually in a couple of weeks, but we decided to celebrate tonight because we were all getting together. And so this episode of the podcast may be a little bit less filtered than the others, <laughs> thanks to rosé and boob cake. I know. I think we've gone on like six tangents in the last like three minutes. Oh, we should explain the boob cake. Though. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Oh. Adrian, it was no. all you. No. Oh. Um, well, Anaya had posted this picture of a cake that was covered in icing boobs. Yeah. Um, or and fondant boobs. I'm yeah. Not sure which. And it was just a million boobs on a cake. Uh, so Adriana had the brilliant idea to get her a birthday cake with boobs. And so what's your friend's name? Mary. She, uh, here's a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Magnolia Lee Baking and Sugar Art. And she's a freaking amazing. And she's self-taught. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. The cake looked amazing and it, and it tasted was delicious. even better. Yeah. Yeah. So but good. I ruined it. No, you didn't. It I melted. Didn't. The Texas sun ruined it. Yes. It, it just did. melted. I know. But we talked about how it kind of made some of the boobs a little more realistic. It's true. Yeah. They were post-breastfeeding <laughs> boobs. <laughs> there, was, there was one nipple that was mangled, which just, <laughs> just happened on occasion. Um, a lot of them were melty. There were definitely asymmetrical breasts, which I see a lot, even in, um, you know, especially in postpartum moms, myself included. Yeah. They don't always look the same. Um, they're sisters, not twins. They're like kind of like your eyebrows. Um, but yeah, so like I was saying, Blah, blah, blah. Back before we talked about Rosie, <laughs> <laughs> rewind <laughs> one more time. Uh, That's my fault. I'm sorry. No, I'm, you're good. I, I'm extra giggly. Yeah, all right. I think we're all a little extra giggly. Um, Adriana, you're gonna have to whip us into shape and keep us in line. You need to ask a question. Yeah. Can yes. You, okay. Can you so <laughs> let's keep. Let's move on. So, baby, um, we all agreed though. So, mm-hmm. breastfeeding or bottle feeding, what's best? Uh, it really depends on the mom, <laughs> the baby, and their particular situation. Yeah, there are absolutely moms and women out there, um, or or I'm sorry, lactating parents out there who are not able to breastfeed or lactate for whatever reason, whether it was due to surgery before baby, um, infrequent stimulation of the breasts in the first mm-hmm. couple of days postpartum. Basically, it could be anything, yeah. um, thyroid, who knows. But there are definitely reasons that people are not able to lactate and produce enough milk for their child. The That being said, breastfeeding doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. Uh-huh. There are varying degrees of breastfeeding. Um, I know a lot of women and a lot of moms who are able to put baby to um, to the to chest or to breast and feed when they're together during maternity leave, for instance. But then when they go back to work because they work long 12-hour shifts as a nurse or because of whatever they do, whatever their occupation, they're not able to pump as frequently as they would like. So they pump as much as they can. They feed their baby when they're together and they make up the difference with formula. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's not... There's no right or wrong way to breastfeed, in my particular opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So ideally, every parent and baby would exclusively breastfeed for six months per the AAP. But that's uh, the key word there is ideally. Mm-hmm. If you're not able to breastfeed or able to breastfeed fully, please don't kick yourself. Uh, this is something I've told to clients that I've seen. Love isn't men- measured in ounces of breast milk. It doesn't matter how you feed your baby as long as you feed your baby. And mm-hmm. I know that lactation consultants especially get a really bad rap for really pushing breastfeeding yeah. and really doing that. Mm-hmm. I know the practice that I work for and me personally, it's it's not about pushing breastfeeding. It's more about supporting the parents and the baby mm-hmm. and making yeah. sure baby is fed, making sure baby is growing, making sure that everybody is happy and content with the plan there. If And I think, Alexis, you were saying yeah. at dinner, it's a relationship. It needs to go both ways. It needs to be wanted by both parties. It's not just, you know, something that the mom forces the baby to do or um, that the baby forces the see again, the lactating parent to do. Yeah. Uh, it needs to be mutually it, beneficial. Exactly. So there's an emotional, in my opinion, there's an emotional component as well. Um, and so especially for, I know I personally, I'm a trauma survivor. Mm-hmm. So I had mm-hmm. some issues with with feeling overtouched, yes. um, which is something that parents feel whether you have a trauma history or not. But if you do have a trauma history, sometimes that can be really amplified in the postpartum period. Mm-hmm. And especially so if you're breastfeeding. Um, and I felt that 
tremendously. For sure. Um, and that was my decision to wean Rowan was because I was not benefiting from the relationship anymore. Not like she would have kept going, mm-hmm. but it was for me. Mm-hmm. Like I was not mutually benefiting anymore and it was the best decision for my emotional and mental health needs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And so there's, I mean, as I said, there's, there's huge, there's a huge gray area with breastfeeding and what that looks like for every family, really. Mm -hmm. For some survivors, I know that they're able to use nipple shields or Mm -hmm. exclusively pump or basically whatever they have to do in order to provide breast milk for their baby. For some, they feed directly at breast without any shields, but then, you know, they reach a certain limit, just like Mm -hmm. you said. And you, you, at that point, you have to figure out, is this beneficial for me as a mother? Is this beneficial for my child? And at some point, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to weigh the the pros and the cons and make the best decision Mm -hmm. for your family. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, like whether you're bottle feeding or breastfeeding, you're still, you can still bond with your baby. So I think some of that talk is related to that and like I'm not going to bond the same way but that's absolutely untrue Mm -hmm. Um, and you can still do things to bond and attach with your baby no matter how you feed them absolutely sometimes it's hard for moms to work through I know it was hard for me there's just so much stigma around uh, I feel like no matter what you do sometimes it feels like you're doing the wrong thing because Mm -hmm. you know if you're breastfeeding um, especially if you breastfeed past age one, eat, there are all these questions surface on when are you going to stop? You know, yeah. isn't baby too old? Yeah. Well, they can eat, right? Why are you still doing it? Exactly. You know, they have teeth, they're going to bite you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and if you're bottle feeding, it's like, well, did you not try best breastfeeding? Yeah. What happened? And why? You know, and it's just. And the worst part is it's like strangers in grocery stores will mm-hmm. ask you questions about why you have formula yeah. in your grocery cart. And it's really none of their damn business. Yeah. And. Mm-hmm. You know, I obviously that's not a path that I walked because I was able to breastfeed my children. But I know that, I mean, the stigma is real. Mm -hmm. And just like with breastfeeding moms being asked to leave facilities, people are all up in the business of Mm -hmm. moms who bottle feed for whatever reason. And also, you don't know what's in that bottle. How do you know that that mom didn't pump breast milk? Mm -hmm. It's it looks the same from a distance for sure. So Mm -hmm. if you're one of those people that questions women on their feeding choices, Mm -hmm. stop. Just yeah. stop. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, so. there's a whole population that exclusively yeah. pumps, which yes, I don't know. I how just they have do that. A, such a level of respect because it's too. so much work yeah. to do that. But it is. that's even another option. Like it's exactly. not just breast or bottle. Like you can be exclusively pumping, and yes, that's talk about a full time job. Yeah, <laughs> that is absolutely a full time job. So to wrap up, babies, as long as they're fed, you're winning. You're awesome. You're an awesome mom. Yep. I agree. Or parent. Wait, or you parent. had another good question on here. What's the best bottle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I wanted God. to hear Naya. Sure. Naya's answer. I, I have a couple of ideas on this. So if you are a, whether, regardless of what is in the bottle that you're feeding your baby, there is a particular way to feed your baby so that they are more in control of the feed. And it's almost like you pace the feed to match baby's cues. It's called paste bottle feeding. We can add a link to it in our visit notes. I've got some great videos and resources. But basically what you do is, is if you're If you're feeding baby at breast, you're mimicking breast behavior with a bottle. So when baby is at breast, they latch on and they'll suckle, 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 get some milk, have several swallows of milk, and then take a pause for about 10 to 15 seconds and then start back up again. What you do when you're feeding your baby a bottle is you work that pause into bottle feeding. Mm -hmm. So you watch for a couple of swallows from babies and then you either tip the bottle backward, or I'm sorry, you completely remove the bottle from their mouth or you tip it up so that way they're only sucking in air. And this way, you follow baby's cues. When they start to suckle again, then you kind of reward them with more milk or with whatever's in the bottle. Uh, And so this really lets baby be in charge of the feed. It helps prevent things like overeating. Um, And the other thing that you can do when you're pace bottle feeding is to sit baby up a little bit more. When babies are on their backs and they're feeding that way, they're in a very vulnerable position for them. Oftentimes they drink whatever's in the bottle because, because it's coming at them, not necessarily because they're hungry. So, um, If you're sitting baby up a little bit more, again, they're more in control. It's more baby-led bottle feeding than just watching them kind of guzzle down a four or five ounce bottle. Mm -hmm. So any bottle works? So. Oh, oh! Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us back around. Um, so, I I recommend bottles that have 
a wide base and a short, wide nipple. Basically, we want it to look like mom's breast, especially if it's, this is a bottle for a breastfed baby. This way, when baby latches onto the bottle, they have to open wide and latch onto not just the bottle nipple, but we want them to get latched on deep enough so that their lips are flanged around that wide base of a bottle, mm-hmm. almost like when they're latched onto the breast. And I think that this is a good way for, um, for babies who are babies of exclusively pumping parents or um, or being formula fed also for them to latch on well because it helps a lot with um, oro motor development or oro functional development sorry not motor motor hands or functional <laughs> development and and it's just really a, a pretty easy way to, to feed baby it does make feed bottle feeding take a little bit longer but then you're also making sure that you're not overfeeding baby that which can lead to less tummy issues less spit up all of those awful things that come when I mean if you think about how we feel when we eat too much we just feel really bloated and sluggish and don't really that way right now <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we unbutton our pants in the recording studio <laughs> I did well, Whatever. I, I pulled mine down <laughs> under my belly, so I'm right there with you. <laughs> but yeah, so babies feel that way too. And oftentimes uh, babies, when they eat too much, they want to suck for comfort. And so we as parents will interpret that as baby still being hungry and will continue to feed baby. And it's really just a vicious cycle because the more that we give them, the more their tummy will hurt, the more they'll want to suck, the more we give them, so on and so forth. Um, but go ahead. Can you... Th- Talk about one of the things I learned. Naya recently came and talked to the doulas with PPHA. Um, and I learned something during your presentation. One, I learned that the bottles, the pre-made formula bottles, that those nipples are like the worst mm-hmm. um, based off what you were just saying. Yes. And then two, about the proper way to make formula. Yes, like, formula prep. You should talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the exact directions in front of me, but we can post a link to them. The CDC has a very specific guidelines of how to make um, powdered formula and very specifically use using um, water that has been boiled to make it sterile. Powdered formula is not sterile. It's the ready-to-feed formulas in those little two-ounce bottles that are sterile, and also the concentrated formula that you can buy in the big jugs that is also sterile. Um, But the powdered formula is not sterile, so it's really important to sterilize your water by bringing it up to boiling and then cooling it back down to 158 degrees, then pouring the formula in per the directions. Look in Adriana's face. This was my face in the training. (laughs) Shaking it all up together, cooling it down to body temperature or to a more, you know, something that's not going to burn your baby's mouth, and then feeding it to them. So... That was my that, reaction. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And Rory was formula fed. And the whole time you were talking, I was like, fuck, <laughs> we yeah. did not do that. Well, the, the reason for that is because of a bacteria called Chronobacter. And in infants that are, it depends on who you talk to, but anywhere from one month to three months, their gut has a real, they really have a hard time. Their immune system has a really hard time dealing with that Chronobacter bacteria. Mm-hmm. And um, it, in some places, it can lead to, um, to basically to infant mortality as uh, actually. In the U.S., it's not as much of a problem, but I know that there have been cases of chronobacter poisoning. I'm not sure what the correct term is that, but basically there have been babies that have died because of the chronobacter bacteria in water sources. And we're talking America. We're talking a first world country. Um, we're not talking about you know places like Flint, Michigan, where God knows what's in their water. Mm. Um, and so, I, unfortunately, this way of preparing formula is not something that's gone over with a lot of parents as lactation consultants. We talk a lot about formula. I know I do with my clients who are not able to to fully breastfeed for whatever reason, whether by choice or by um, just whatever. But we, we make sure that clients are ready and they're able to prepare formula correctly for their baby to make sure that everything is handled in a safe manner to prevent issues like chronobacter. Or you talked about as much as you could getting that ready-made formula and like asking, because most times pediatricians have that on hand or Mm -hmm. OB-GYNs, like just asking for samples Samples, because they have a shit ton in their closet hiding somewhere. Exactly. Or Um, or they'll have coupons or something. Um, But pouring that into the bottle with the wider base and the shorter nipple because the nipples on those are small and long. Yeah. And then what I learned. I was listening. I I know you were. (laughs) We've seen, oftentimes we've seen babies that use 
use those, um, especially if they're breastfed babies that are getting supplemented for whatever reason because the nipple is so long. They tend to almost slurp it in like a straw, and then they try to do the same thing at breast, which is just no bueno because that hurts. Uh, mm-hmm. Trying to slurp in a nipple instead of opening wide to latch on. <laughs> so mom is in pain. Baby's not transferring um, breast milk adequately. It's just it's a big issue. But yes, um, the type of bottle that you use matters. So I did not know that. Uh, <laughs> Neither did I. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Chronobacter yeah. is v- it's very rare. It oh. happens, but it is very, very rare, especially in America. Fancy water. That's all I know. He got okay. reverse osmosis, Ooh. pH balance shit. Berkey. So, Berkey. Did but you that counts, Berkey? right? You don't have to do all the boiling if you buy the bottled water. The, you or no, you may do. still have to do it oh, because shit. of the sources of the bottled water. I don't know, whatever. He oh. survived. He's, he's fine. He's one. Okay. Okay. Rory survived too. He's, he's cool. Was, he was formula fed. <laughs> um, but in terms of bottles, so. Jack didn't take, like, he didn't want anything. Mm-hmm. He didn't care. Um, but I did breastfeed him for two and a half years. And then, like, after one, he decided, no, yeah, we'll take something. But it was off and on, and it didn't really work out. Galen took anything. Yeah, I had wow. two opposites, too. Yeah. R- Rory would take anything. And, and I mean, um, and I breastfed uh, Galen up to 10 months, and he's yeah. still, any bottle, he's like, whatever, give it to me. Yeah. Feed me. Some babies were really picky. I mean, you hear about those stories where baby will not take a bottle. They'll just, mm-hmm. they'll want mom, really, or, um, or the parent and feed right from the top. Yeah, I'd also just like to plug lactation consultants because I had, I think back to my feeding relationship Mm -hmm. with Rory and there's a lot of disappointment. So I wanted to breastfeed um, and I did for about a month and then there was issues with his weight and our pediatrician recommended supplementing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so I was basically doing both. I was still wasn't giving up on breastfeeding. And then I went back to work and- my supply just Mm -hmm. dried up completely so hard Mm -hmm. um and i would pump like and come home with like half an ounce and cry about it and it was awful and so i eventually we just transitioned to full-time formula but with all of that said i i never had support of a lactation consultant and i think that i was getting some pretty not supportive advice from our pediatrician and other people Mm -hmm. um and knowing now some of the things I know, I look back and I'm like, if that was different and that was different, maybe that experience would have looked different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So reaching out for support too can yeah. be so wonderful and really kind of change the trajectory. Is that a word? Trajectory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Trajectory you're right. you're that you're on. Yeah. And um, some insurance covers it. I was um, just, yes. just going to say that. Yeah. Um, when I find out my, cl- I send all my clients to Naya and especially if I find out that they have insurance, mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. dude, you get like five visits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. The practice that I'm with is in network with a couple of really big providers and, uh, it's fantastic. We can see clients in our office and there's no charge for them. And that's up to like five or six visits. Usually we have everything kind of sorted out and we're on the right path after a few, but sometimes moms will save those um, those visits, those extra visits for starting solids or when they go back to work or, you know, if something comes up in the middle um, of all that. So yeah, insurance is supposed to, per the Affordable Care Act of 2010, uh, no wait, 2012, sorry. Affordable Care Act of 2012, <laughs> lactation support is supposed to be fully covered. However, there are insurance companies that will find loopholes and reasons mm. to not cover it. Yeah. Uh, that being said, it is quite possible for you to see a lactation consultant pay her upfront, her, sorry, he per, pay him or her because there's male lactation consultants, but pay him or her up front and then receive a super bill um, that you can submit to your insurance company for reimbursement. Mm-hmm. And you may not get full reimbursement. Sometimes it just depends on how persistent you can be with following up on it. But um, you should at least get something back. Legally, you're supposed to get everything back. But like I said, oftentimes these companies will find the littlest loophole and find a reason not to give you anything. Mm-hmm. I have a love-hate relationship with them. Obviously. Yeah. Well, same for mental health. Yes. <laughs> mental health. Yes. <laughs> so let's move on up to older babies and solids. solids. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So when did you guys start feeding? Yeah, I know you guys have older kiddos. And mm-hmm. I think it's changed mm-hmm. recently, you know, on when to feed, what age, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Definitely um, recommendations on rice cereal has changed. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Which Rory got. At and my oldest months, did too. At four months, rice cereal. And that was, he's almost six. So that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. No, that yeah. And ago. see, it was out already for Jack, who's four. And that was a recommendation from our pediatrician. Yeah. Um, 
So that's what we did. So Mm -hmm. the AAP and other uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, recommend exclusively breastfeeding or formula feeding for the first four to six months of life. Solids can be introduced as early as four months, but it's really not recommended until babies are six months because of gut maturity Mm -hmm. um, and, and things pertaining to that and really making sure that, especially if you're breastfeeding, that the the good stuff basically and i'm drawing a blank with the Mm -hmm. names of the specific (laughs) components but all of the good stuff um that helps mature gut flora Mm -hmm. is there in place and that infant's Mm -hmm. guts are strong enough to handle solid foods Mm -hmm. uh that being said go ahead oh i just i also know that i it also something about like head control and yeah there's there's even you might have a four-month-old who doesn't have great head control yet so maybe they need to wait a little bit longer because then it's like a choking hazard. Yeah. Is they, that true? They mm-hmm. need to, ideally, they would need to have um, a pincer grasp. So the ability mm-hmm. to pick things up, their thung- their tongue thrust reflex should be gone by that point. They should also be able to sit up independently. And typically mm-hmm. all of that stuff happens right around six months. Mm-hmm. So that's where the six months came in. But recently the AAP, and by recently, I mean just a couple of years ago, the AAP revised their recommendations and made it four to six months instead of just six months. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is uh, or comes from that school of thought um, on that study that was done on allergies Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also um, the flavor window. Have you guys heard about that or read about that? Tell me about it. Um, It was an article. I'm pretty sure it was through NPR. So um, if you can introduce several, like as many flavors as possible between four and six months, um, and it doesn't mean like giving them full meals. It's like literally like a dip of hummus, you know, into their mouth or spi- like certain spices mm-hmm. and stuff. They're more likely to have a wider and more ready palate when they're mm-hmm. older. And it's easier for them to adjust to different, you know, flavors. Interesting. Um, and then there's also the allergies that the younger mm-hmm. they are, that you introduce them to certain things. They're less likely to have certain allergies to certain things. Mm-hmm. Um which I thought was really interesting. I also had a friend who's pediatrician. I guess there's another train of thought around introducing the allergens first. Yes. So like her pediatrician, they started with um, peanut butter, Mm -hmm. eggs. uh, What am I? There's more (laughs) that I'm not thinking of. Soy and dairy. probably. Yes, dairy. um, So the more common allergens, Mm -hmm. you start with those first. So not even like a vegetable or a fruit. Um, Mm -hmm. She started with all of those first because the idea is that they're less likely to develop an allergy for it. Yes. So anyways. So I'm wondering if that's where that adjustment came in because a lot of parents are realizing, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. Yeah. But that food window that you were mentioning, um, I read somewhere and there's a study, I'm almost positive, that breastfed babies are exposed to more tastes because Mm -hmm. of the taste of different foods that can kind of come through breast milk occasionally. Mm -hmm. So they may, I I don't know if it's theorized or if there was a study to kind of quote unquote prove it, but they tend to have wider palates and they're more willing to try new foods. I do have to say that that's a a load of crap (laughs) because my youngest does not, well, maybe he's the exception to the rule, but he's not, he's very picky. Yeah. Yeah. Galen right now is surviving off of freaking peanut butter crackers. Uh, That's what he's eating. Peanut butter crackers and pouches. I can't get him to eat anything else. Yeah. And his pediatrician was like, yeah, right now is the perfect time to introduce a war, like a variety of foods. And he looks at stuff and grabs it and drops it on the floor. Like, I'm not <laughs> eating this shit. This is gross. Mother, what are you giving me? Yeah. And and and, and his one of his first words is cracker. Cracker, I saw yeah. that That's video. That's hilarious. <laughs> and I'm just like, really? We're going to eat more crackers? Okay. Oh. Yeah, I have a picky eater, too. And I, I actually used to... Uh, blame it on the fact that like I started him on rice cereal at four months and then like (laughs) then with Rowan and then even then like I think I started with fruits next and then he had some vegetables which he ate in the puree stage he ate all the things Mm -hmm. and he eventually had like meat and but now I don't even know when it started maybe somewhere around one and a half or two he just refused everything especially vegetables Um, And he pretty much, I make the same lunch for him every single day, peanut butter and jelly, a banana or an apple. Those are the only fruits he'll eat. 
um, and a yogurt pouch. Mm -hmm. So he's still in pouches, whether it's yogurt or applesauce. We we do yogurt. A five year old. (laughs) So yeah, I have an eight year old and a four year old. I'm I'm not too far behind, or seven and a half and four, but yeah. And I, in the midst of that whole, from like two to now. I've literally tried so many different things from like forcing him to eat and crying myself to sleep because it was so awful and traumatizing Mm -hmm. to starving him and giving him a plate of what we had for dinner and for over a week him going to bed without dinner. Mm -hmm. And I eventually was just like, fuck it. Like, I don't care. There was definitely stigma around that. I was Mm -hmm. getting some passive aggressive comments from people Mm -hmm. about his eating and I just decided to stop caring and was I, like, what comments? Yeah, like, what, what, like, what were they? Um, they that? <laughs> I'm just curious because, like, who, it's your kid. I don't know. Just like a, that's not what we did. Mm. Um, you know, like, yeah. shit like that. And it's like, that's cool that that's not what you did. Like, I would never make my kid another meal, like a separate meal. Oh like, we only feed people, feed people. <laughs> we only feed the family what we cook. We only cook mm-hmm. one meal, like, things like that. Which I understand that's fine. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that the I would never statements make me want to punch (laughs) Mm -hmm. somebody in the face? Yeah. Usually the person saying those statements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you would never? Then don't. So, and I think that often those comments are coming when you don't have a whole picture of what we've Mm -hmm. been experiencing as a family. Like you're not at our dinner table Mm -hmm. every single night and you haven't experienced all the different things that we've tried with our child. And it just got exhausting. It was mentally exhausting. And I felt like it was impacting my relationship with him. And he, I definitely have given him some of my anxiety. And I think some of that was playing into it. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided like it was the best thing for everyone to just cut all that shit out and make him his peanut butter and jelly and banana every day. And that's what we've done. And actually recently he has randomly asked to try things on his own. So I've tried to remind myself of that. Like Rowan was eating cantaloupe and he was like, I think I want to try cantaloupe. And he gagged when he put it in his mouth, but he, he He did it. it. He asked on his own. He tried it on his own. And I don't think that he's going to go to college and only eat peanut butter and jelly. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I think hope. one well, day he will eat something else. You can save on meal plans. Though. There <laughs> right? you go. I don't know. But no. I just don't give a shit anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm, no, I'm done caring. And if people want to be judge me, then so be it. And they they can come over and they can try and feed him. <laughs> right. That's what I tell them. You do your thing. Um, my youngest like survives on chicken fingers or chicken nuggets rather. Chicken nuggets are his jam so mm. whatever or chicken nuggets and lately it's been spaghetti and meatballs which i'm grateful for but most of the time he doesn't eat the meatballs it's just the spaghetti mm-hmm. um but he was kind of the opposite of rory there where he was bra- he didn't like solids he didn't take to solids until he was about a 10 or 11 months old so he was pretty much exclusively breastfed until that time and i was fine with it because i was home with him and i could feed him anytime mm-hmm. he was hungry uh, and we tried to introduce solids. We put fruit in front of him, like sweeter fruit too, because you know, breast milk is sweet. So we thought maybe we could do sweeter fruit. He wasn't into purees. He'd just kind of make this face if I tried to feed him. He liked to sit there and he preferred to eat like little blueberries or baked be or I'm sorry, um, black beans or mm-hmm. just uh, cantaloupe, actually. Funny mm-hmm. story. Cantaloupe or melon or any of those really sweet melons. Um, and French fries, because he is my child, after all. <laughs> but um, but he was, you know, he was breastfed until he was almost a year old. And he was over, like, his uh, percentiles and everything. He was huge. He was on, definitely on the, the larger end of all of that. And so his pediatrician was like, look, don't push it. I mean, he's obviously growing and thriving and doing well in what, whatever you're doing. He's, and her exact words were, he's not going to be breastfeeding exclusively when he's three. And she's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's just really important. Important, just like you were saying, to to focus on your child and really try and ignore some of that noise and that static around you. Mm-hmm. I feel like as parents, especially as mothers, we tend to know what is best for our child, um, especially because we just we have that bond with them. And like you said, sometimes it's just not worth the battle every mm-hmm. night of screaming and you getting frustrated and your child getting frustrated. It's just not worth it. And there's even some nights now, like last night. He threw a fit because we made hamburgers for dinner and he did not want to eat his hamburger. Mm. And so my husband's like, you have to eat it or you're just going to bed. I'm like, babe, he's four. I was like, I'm tired. You're tired. 
Let's just make him a PB and J sandwich and just let him go to bed. He'll eat bananas. He'll have apples. He'll mm-hmm. get fruit and veggies. He's getting some protein from that. Mm-hmm. The kid loves milk, so he's getting you know protein and vitamin D and calcium and all that from there. So he eats a balanced diet. It may not look quite like the not the food pyramid, I guess, like the food plate. Mm-hmm. It may not look quite exactly like that, but he's hitting everything. He's still doing well with his percentiles and his weight. So and you know what? Um, I have definitely had a tantrum before as an adult about not wanting to eat a hamburger burger or whatever it is that my husband yep. is choosing for dinner. So same. <laughs> grownups have preferences just the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're putting a lot of pressure on kiddos in that way mm-hmm. of like, I don't really feel like eating this right now. Yeah. Like sometimes that's what's going on. Not necessarily. Right. I don't want to eat a vegetable. It's just, I'm just not into this meal today. Right. I'm in a bad mood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like grownups have those moments. Absolutely. Or like <laughs> I want comfort food. I want a yeah. cheese sandwich. I don't want a hamburger or a sausage or, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, one of my friends asked, uh, she's like, what are you doing with Galen? He eats everything. <laughs> and this was after she saw like a picture of him mm-hmm. um, holding the Hat Creek Burger and <laughs> eating the Hat Creek Burger. He's like 10 months old. Um, and I told her the same thing. I was like, you know, all kids are different for him that like he can do that. But what made me realize um, she was saying that she was trying to do the um, pureed food and trying to spoon feed. And he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it. And um, everything she was describing was um, a part of Galen that we went through, that we experienced, and we shifted our way of thinking, which you did too, but I don't know if you realized with Rohan where it seemed like he would eat whatever he could hold or grab himself, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Is this baby-led weaning? Yes. And that you're talking about? I don't know. No? That's a thing. Oh, maybe yes then? I'm just saying that's what I figured out. Is Baby led weaning is like not purees. Oh no, we do purees, but he so Galen has to hold his own pouch. Uh, and he sucks it down. Oh, okay. So baby led uh, weaning is like you give them a yeah, piece, little, pieces. Uh, little pieces of the whole food. Yeah. You don't blend yeah. it. Someone has told me that, like yeah. several people have told me that I do that. And uh, and I'm like, I guess That's I what I thought you were saying. Yeah. Because <laughs> if he can hold something, if he can, he'll eat it. If I try and spoon feed him, he won't eat it. But yeah. it's, He wants he, control. He'll also do the pouch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he'll yeah. suck down a pouch like it's nobody's business. Mm-hmm. But if I touch it, you know, like, he's dropping it. He's mm-hmm. not eating it. And I told her, I was like, well have you tried seeing if you know give him things that he can hold or touch and Mm -hmm. um she did write back she was like that was it yeah and i was like some babies they're just ready for that autonomy sooner than what we think you know and Mm -hmm. for jack he wasn't there yet and for galen he just really wanted that control for himself Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. um and it just got lucky that that advice i gave her was what worked but it sometimes doesn't sometimes babies just don't they're not ready for whatever you know Mm -hmm. um and it's the same for older kiddos and Um, I think with Jack, we've gotten lucky in that we've tried. I'm going to sound like the villain. I'm going to sound like those people you guys are describing. But (laughs) um, we did the, you know, this is what we're having for dinner. But I would always make sure, and I still always make sure to have something I know he'll eat. Mm -hmm. So we'll be eating whatever we're eating, but we'll have like yogurt and blueberries or you know something I tried like that. that too yeah and exactly and sometimes that doesn't work <laughs> like i read you nope. put something they you know they like yeah. on the yeah. plate with whatever you're making we did yeah. that too and it didn't work yeah and sometimes it doesn't <laughs> um and some nights it doesn't work but i i also am like okay and when he would say he doesn't want it you know or whatever i'm like okay i was like well you can have something in the morning but i left it at that i mm-hmm. i just let him go without eating and for jack it wasn't i think because i was telling him okay you can have something different in the morning. Mm-hmm. It kind of confused him. He was like, oh, okay, I don't have to eat it, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> so he would always just let it go. Um, and then we cooked a lot together. Like I had him cooking with me because I got to stay home with him. Mm-hmm. I had him cooking in the kitchen with me at 18 months. Like he had his own set of little nylon knives at two. I um, bought him chopping. Yeah. yeah. What are those things called? We bought one of those things. You know, the big tower. The kitchen helper? The learning tower. Learning tower. Oh, I bought a learning tower yeah. because I'm a picky eater to try to get it. Yeah, the and kitchen we did that. Because I read that too. If yeah. they make it, they're more likely to eat it. Yeah. Didn't fucking it work. It doesn't always work. Yeah. That works sometimes. <laughs> um, like he would get really ambitious and want to, but a lot of times it wouldn't. Um, so it was just hit or miss. And I, because we're like, I come from a family of overeaters, which might be on the other side of where you're from. I never wanted to push food. You know, I did. Yeah. I just let it go. So if he didn't want to eat, he didn't eat. And mm-hmm. I think that's a struggle sometimes for Steven because he's on the other side where you finish your plate. You know, that old school. 
Um, Clean your plate. There's yes. starving kids. And he says that all the time. I'm like, how is this going to help the starving yeah. kid if he eats it? You know, and yeah. Jack doesn't get that. He's a four. So I'm always like, we're kind of, there's a little discourse there, discord mm-hmm. there, where, you know, I'm like, just let it go. Who cares? If he doesn't yeah. eat, he doesn't eat. It doesn't. And the thing about picky eaters is I do think a lot of it is about the child and their personality and Mm -hmm. whatever. Because Rowan, we, so like I said, like I just was doing what my pediatrician said the first time that I knew more the second time. And I was like, oh, no, no rice cereal this time. We're going to start at six months. We're going to start with vegetables. Mm -hmm. Like I was doing everything different. And I would say that their feeding experiences were completely opposite for a while. And she would eat anything. Like she loved salmon and kale and mushrooms and Mm -hmm. lots of weird shit that Rory never would touch. Right. But recently, as a three-year-old, I've been dealing with some picky eating with her, which I think is more just like control. Yes, I agree. I'm in charge. Um, Not that she doesn't like. She definitely has a wider palate than him still. Um, Mm -hmm. But... I don't know. It also just has to do with your kid. And I think, I do think, I have looked into, there's like feeding therapy with an OT that you can do. I think some of it is sensory for him and the texture. I was about to say. Um, But we haven't invested in that. (laughs) Because it's expensive and he's already in speech therapy. (laughs) I actually had a client who's a, a, she's an SLP. She's a speech therapist. And she's like, she was. She and I were talking shop because obviously as a speech therapist and as a lactation consultant, mm-hmm. we can talk about things together. Um, and she's like, you know, are there any – she's like, I really want to open an office that's just feeding therapy. I'm like, could you please? Because that would be amazing. Most of the physical – or the speech therapy – I think it's OT. occupational therapy. Yeah, mostly. it's occupational. Yeah, there is one in Lakeway, of course. <laughs> oh, there's there's several in the Austin area. Like the, I met a lady who specializes in feeding, in feeding that's yeah. in Lakeway, but. She doesn't take insurance. Oh. It's one million dollars. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's um and we're already investing in speech therapy for him. So I'm just I'm just like I don't care. <laughs> You're alive. You're yeah. making you're Whatever. fine. PBJs are fine right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally <You're> cool. okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Um so I think we uh, we cap on picky eaters or on eaters or feeding mm-hmm. children at like age seven so sorry for those of you who have older children and need yeah are there any feeding issues with uh, <laughs> right. school age kids oh i had yeah. a question um, i had a question yeah <laughs> so jack is starting pre-k and you're the only one that has a child in public school okay <laughs> talk to me about school lunches oh yeah right i just thought of something now oh, that you said okay. that that was one of the reasons i had anxiety about rory going to the public yeah, school yeah i could see they that they only have 20 minutes for fucking lunch yeah and they have this yeah. whole discussion about they literally don't help them with anything whether you bring their lunch yep. or they have to go through the line yeah. they have to do it completely independently pay for it get it sit down and do mm-hmm. all of that in 20 minutes and i was like that's fucked up. Like, I don't know. There's stuff though to make that easier because I ran into that. I had read that when Jack started um, his little daycare school and so I prepared for it like preemptively because I'm a freak and I bought the Bentgo boxes yeah. like that you and I, I was it, we to, would practice at yeah, home yeah. Mm-hmm. before he started school he's like two I'm sure he was like what the hell are we doing yeah and I'm like open it come on you know so he knew already how to open it it has all the compartments and you're set you're ready yeah um, I I was talking to another friend who recommended that yeah. but I still think that's unrealistic like as a culture but, yeah oh totally just as a, like culturally yeah. that yeah. speaks to kind of some of the issues in public school around time like they have really short uh recesses Mm -hmm. they you know like um and they're so academically focused and it's like really kindergartners only have 20 minutes like i need more than 20 minutes to eat some days like Mm -hmm. you know like um or i feel like me as an adult i should be the only one rushing to scarf down my food not my poor kindergarten five-year-old yeah i don't know but tell us about your grown child and my grown child my (laughs) seven and a half year old um we started off So I just want to say that, you know, in kindergarten for the first couple of weeks of school, his teacher did go with them into the Mm -hmm. cafeteria, like walk them through the line, made sure they understood how to do it, what their little code was to buy things. And so my son loved buying food to the point where um, this year in first or this past year in first grade, 
he just wouldn't eat the lunches that we would make him. Mm-hmm. He'd be like, oh, I forgot that I had lunch today and uh, I just bought instead. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, all right, I get this. So it got to the point where it's like, well, why are we spending money on you know yogurt and cheese and fruit and all that stuff that he's not going to eat? He's just going to throw it away or he's going to bring it back uneaten and the ice pack will have cooled off and will have uh, warmed up actually and like thawed. Mm -hmm. And so we can't even use it for dinner or any other time. So we just kind of decided that if he's so into buying hot lunch, then he can buy hot lunch. And, you know, that makes it easier for us. So mm-hmm. I don't quite think that's the solution that you're looking for. But I think oh, I'm just curious how it for, works <laughs> for him. It's more like I'm a big boy. Mm-hmm. I'm, you know, it's a little bit of autonomy, a little bit that. of freedom. I did have a friend tell me that uh, I guess the supervision wasn't as um, what's the word? Uh, awesome. I don't know. Whatever. Diligent. Yeah. yeah diligent. Anyway, she said something about how her kid was, they f- got the bill later yeah, yeah. and you could buy ice cream. Oh, and no. So like oh. for the first two weeks of school, <laughs> the kid only bought ice cream, oh, but like gosh. none of the teachers noticed. So I'm like, seriously, nobody noticed that this kid was just eating ice cream every wow. day. That's funny. Yeah, so they had a racked up bill of ice cream, um, which is what my kid would do. Well, you know, I can't blame him. I I want to eat ice cream every day. Yeah. But I don't know. That's one of my fears about public school Mm -hmm. is that you can't. You're you're letting him go. For what it's worth. He does get, they have a snack time in the afternoon, so we do give him something to eat every day as a snack. His lunch is insanely early. Um, in kindergarten, it was at like 10.20. Oh my God, I've heard that too. In first grade, it was 10.50 to 11.20, I know. But it makes sense because they're going in at 7 a.m. They're going in at 7 a.m., so they're hungry. My kid's going to be starving by 10. I know, but then they have an afternoon snack. They eat at like 1 or or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then um, his after-school program gives him a snack as well, and Mm -hmm. I pack extra snacks for him, too, to eat after Mm -hmm. school. And then usually by the time I pick him up, like 4.35, both of them are starving, and so I'll give him a little snack while we fix Mm -hmm. dinner and things. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I need to like mentally prepare for Galen. I have a feeling we're going to struggle with him, but Jack just goes with the flow. He doesn't yeah. give a like. I mean, yeah, he doesn't give a fuck. Kind of like Rowan, where they're just like, whatever. <laughs> oh yeah, with the I'm going to do what I want. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to humor you all. That was so hard. That picture we took. <laughs> I was like, just look at the fucking camera. I know. Sorry. I saw him, and I was like, inside, I was celebrating that Rowan decided to cooperate that day. Yeah. I was like, yay, I don't have to do what she's doing. <laughs> I know. I had to bribe my kid, you guys, this weekend. It was not a proud moment for me, but... Oh, I bribe Rowan all the time. We, we do. We're I'm, not above please, it. Please, no. I try not to because, again, there's that weird, like, stigma for me with food because, like, we're all overeaters and, mm-hmm. you know, you shouldn't reward with food. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try not to with Jack and... But yeah, we just had to because he hates the blogger. The blogger's child that the blog is about the child hates being in photographs. <laughs> so That's yeah, funny. that has totally backfired on me. Anyway, I think we're going to wrap this up. Are we? Do we have anything else to add? No. No? Okay. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys that... Um, our squad friends that you can find Rooted Baby at the Texas Farmer's Market at Mueller or order a subscription online at rootedbaby.com. Um, and I think that's it, guys, right? Yep. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Woo. Thanks for listening to Top Knot Squad. If you like what you hear, then be sure to click the subscribe button in your podcast app. And while you're there, leave us a review. Want to internet stalk us? Find us on Facebook or Instagram at Top Knot Squad and interact with us. We love making new friends.